Cool. Okay. Um, thanks for coming along, everybody. I'm Doug Chivers. I'm a security architect at HP Cloud. I've uh, been here for a bunch of years now. And together with uh, Tim Kelsey and Tom Kamen, I'm going to talk to you about Secure Ephemeral PKI with the Anchor Project. So, um, first up, I'm going to talk to you about Ephemeral PKI, explain what one is. Uh, Tim is going to talk to you about our implementation of Ephemeral PKI. And Tom is going to talk to you about how it's deployed in HP Helion OpenStack. So, uh, first up, what is an ephemeral PKI and why do I want one? So, today everyone seems to care about cloud security. It's the number one barrier to cloud adoption. It's what most of our customers are worried about. Um, and effectively, we need to make cloud secure. Um, so, I'm going to start covering very briefly why you need a PKI at all, and then drop into what an ephemeral PKI is and why one of those is better and you need one of them more. So, um, typical cloud deployment's got loads of services. Uh, you've got Nova, Swift, Glance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, traditionally, you'd separate them into security domains, uh, look at some sort of filtering, some sort of monitoring between the security domains, um, maybe using physical separation if you're particularly cautious, maybe using VLANs. Um, and this works great on paper, but then you come to add in all the other services you need to make a system work, and you end up with a huge number of things needing to talk to lots of other things. Um, this doesn't work out so well, so... Uh, the next step is your security guy tells you to turn on TLS, because everyone knows you just turn on TLS. Um, and this makes everything confidential, secure, more cryptos has got to be better, right? Um, unfortunately, all the supporting services also need TLS, although there are some exceptions. Um, turn all of that on, and it's all happy, except TLS needs some supporting infrastructure of its own. Um, most TLS deployments use X509 certificates to identify the TLS endpoints. Um, typically, you use certificates on the server, uh, but in some cases, you use them on the client as well. Um, and the certificates are obtained by submitting a CSR to a registration authority, uh, which handles um, decision-making, um, issuing decisions, and then the certificate authority handles the actual signing of the certificate. Um, during the process, a server owner uh, would submit a CSR to the RA, um, the certificate administrator will uh, look at the fields in the certificate uh, and go, do these meet our policy? Uh, are they sensible? Is this server owner trying to do the right thing? And if it matches, then uh, issue the certificate. Um, the certificate authority also provides a bunch of revocation functionality so that if the administrator decides he's made a mistake and shouldn't have issued that certificate, or if the certificate becomes compromised, he can then uh, revoke that. However, there's a few issues associated with this. Um, firstly, revocation is largely theoretical. Uh, there's a couple of mechanisms, uh, a CRL and OCSP. Certificate revocation lists are just what they sound like. They're a list of certificates that are revoked. Unfortunately, this becomes largely unwieldy in real life. Uh, I don't think any operating systems ship with CRLs for quite a while, and uh, they need to be maintained and kept up to date. Um, secondly, you've got OCSP, Online Certificate Status Protocol, uh, which is implemented in a bunch of web browsers, but in almost no client libraries whatsoever. So neither of these things work particularly well in service-to-service -service architectures. Um, secondly, uh, bulk, certificate, bulk certificate refresh is pretty difficult. Uh, if you end up yourself in a heartbleed situation where you need to refresh all the private keys in your organization, ideally by yesterday, uh, it's very hard to figure out which ones are still in use. Uh, you better hope your PKI and your CMDB are very tightly tied together. Otherwise, you'll have, well, roughly a week spending figuring out which certificates are which, it's still in use and which ones aren't. Um, another problem is that manual certificate administration is not 100%. Uh, people make mistakes. I have issued certificates incorrectly, uh, and I'm the person who wrote certificate policies, so I should know what has been issued. Um, if your certificate administrator says they've never issued a certificate incorrectly, they're probably either mistaken or lying. Uh, the worst part is they may well have not noticed they did it. Um, and finally, certificates expire. Everyone knows that certificates are going to expire, but sometimes it still catches you out, and it quite often results in a 3 a.m. phone call asking why something's gone offline. So, ephemeral PKI. We've taken an alternative approach to PKI um, and are focusing on using passive revocation rather than active revocation. 
Uh, we do this with short-term certificates, which are typically valid for 12 to 24 hours. Um, passive verification works with certificate expiry, so once a certificate has expired, then it's no longer regarded as valid. Clients, more or less, more or less without exception, support this and um, apply strong uh, checking to expiry dates, even if they don't do any verification checking at all. Um, clearly, replacing the private key is a client decision, but when the certificates are being bounced every 12 to 24 hours, it's not a massive challenge to replace the private keys as well. And uh, at this point, you've got a poor man's version of perfect forward secrecy. Um, so the nice thing about passive verification is there's no need for CRLs or OCSP. You simply wait for the certificate to expire. Um, in the event a certificate needs to be revoked, you just wait 12 hours and don't issue it another one. Now, clearly, maintaining this is not something that a certificate administrator could do. We have probably 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 certificates running on our public cloud at any moment. Um, a whole bunch of those are still in use. Some of them aren't. Can't tell you which ones. Um, and no certificate administrator could replace 3,000 certificates every day. So at this point, we built a uh, rules-based certificate issuing and um, uh, management process called Anchor. Um, the ephemeral PKI uses a rules-based decision engine which applies a series of validators um, to enforce a certificate policy. The certificate policy is roughly the same as a certificate administrator would use when he's making a manual decision, um, except it's enforced automatically, so it's enforced 100% every time. And finally, uh, it's a stateless system, so it's easy to deploy and high availability. Uh, which has some nice benefits, like you can deploy it in silos. So if I don't want my Nova nodes to trust my Swift PKI, then I simply don't install the trust anchor for that, and a compromised Swift certificate couldn't be used to impersonate a Nova node, say. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Tim, who's going to talk to you about the anchor project, which is our implementation of this. Thank you, Doug. Okay, uh, so uh, my name's Tim Kelsey. I'm a security engineer working uh, mostly upstream for HP. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Anchor. Okay. Cool. Uh, right, so as uh, Doug's mentioned, the basic idea of what an ephemeral PKI actually is and what advantages it has. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that it, there's a lot more um, requests, a lot more certificates uh, needed to be refreshed a lot more quickly. Uh, so Anchor is uh, our ephemeral CA implementation and an automatic uh, registration authority. It issues very short lifetime certificates um, as part of a, a, a public key infrastructure. And uh, the key points there are that it uh, has no active revocation mechanism at all. Uh, it relies entirely on passive revocation. Uh, it is itself uh, ephemeral, it's stateless, which means it's very easy to deploy in uh, HA configurations and what have you. Uh, and it has uh, no uh, additional deployment overhead. You don't need to add OCSP responders or maintain databases and what have you of who's got what certificates. You, you just issue them and basically forget um, because they're going to expire um, and you rely on your policy to uh, not reissue uh, bad certificates. Okay. So Anchor itself is a fairly recent project that evolved from an internal component that we developed at HP. Um, it's since been open sourced, released under the Apache 2 license, and is available on Stackforge. The project itself falls under the auspices of the newly formed Security Project. Uh, this was formerly the OpenStack Security Group and the Vulnerability Management Team, who have now merged. Um, so this is uh, one of the projects which now lies under uh, that project. Uh, so we desire um, Anchor to be a good OpenStack citizen. Uh, so we have a very strong focus on our CI/CD uh, gate tests. We're aiming for 100% test coverage. We've probably got about 98% currently, so we're well on the way to getting that. And we've also integrated a tool called Bandit into our gate test. Bandit is another security project undertaking. It's a, uh, a tool for scanning Python code automatically and flagging up potential security problems. It's kind of like a linter, but with a specific security focus. We actually have a talk later this week about Bandit specifically, so if anyone's interested in that, uh, come along. Uh, and finally, we've tried to make uh, strong idiomatic choices uh, for our libraries and dependencies and bits and pieces, so there shouldn't be any surprises uh, to anybody who's familiar uh, to, uh, 
working on any uh, OpenStack component when looking at the code base. So functionally, Anchor falls in, uh, it breaks down into four main um, functional blocks. We have a, a REST API, as you'd expect. We have an authentication system, the decision engine, and then finally, the certificate issuing system. So a REST API is built upon Pecan, as you would expect. It's uh, very simple, very minimal. We actually only have a single endpoint, uh, slash sign. This is uh, an example of actually using a, a very simple request shown on screen there. Um, we have four basic headers. You provide a user to indicate who's requesting the certificate. We have a secret field. This is uh, used by the authentication module, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we have the CSR, that's a, an X509 certificate signing request. And, and finally, um, a field to indicate how that CSR has been encoded. We only support PEM at the moment, but that's a future flexible thing. So uh, once the REST API has uh, ascertained that all the expected fields are available, the next thing is the authentication module. So Anchor actually ships today with three um, different authentication modules that can be configured through a JSON configuration file. We have a very basic uh, shared secret module. This it just uses a, a pre-configured shared secret stored in the configuration file itself. Uh, it's very basic, not particularly secure, but it is self-contained. So if anyone wants to try out Anchor or run it in a test environment or what have you, it's the easy choice. Uh, in addition to that, we have a Keystone-based authentication module which uses a Keystone token. And this has the advantage that it can pass through uh, role information uh, into the decision engine. And I'll speak about that in the next slide. Uh, and we have an LDAP implementation which passes through group membership as opposed to Keystone roles. So assuming the authentication module says, yep, everything is great, we move on to the next step, which is the decision engine. Um, the decision engine is our automatic registration authority, effectively. Um, so as uh, Doug mentioned, it's built out of a series of rule chains, which are built from composable validators, where a validator is simply a Python function. We didn't use any uh, domain-specific language or anything complicated here. Python, we all know it, and it does the job quite nicely. So um, effectively, the CSR is uh, presented along with any um, extracted authentication details to each of the validators in each of the validation chains. The validator will run. Uh, either it will exit cleanly, which indicates that the check passed, or it will fire an exception to say, yes, yeah, something's wrong. And in the event of an exception, we bail out and uh, report an error to the user. Uh, as each uh, step in the validator chain executes, we emit appropriate log events uh, to say if it failed, if it passed, why, what have you, uh, for the purposes of forensics and auditing. So Anchor uh, ships with a whole bunch of these validators. There's a lot of um, interesting stuff. Um, Conceptually, they fall into three sets. We don't really make a hard distinction in the code. They're, they're all just functions, but you can think about them this way. So at the lowest level, we have uh, CSR sanity checking. Uh, these just make sure that all the right punctuation is in the right places in the CSR. It's just syntax, really. Um, right number of fields and no duplications and bits and pieces. Uh, so above that, we have uh, validators which enforce the security policy. Uh, these check that the um, FQDNs are correct, that the, they resolve to appropriate IP addresses, and everything is as, as you would expect it to be uh, based on whatever security policy uh, you have. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps most interestingly, we have a number of validators which encode uh, expert knowledge. And this is specific information about um, how Anchor is being used and how your actual cloud deployment is configured. So as uh, Doug mentioned, you could silo off uh, an Anchor instance to provide certificates for your Nova nodes. Uh, in that scenario, you might have a, a naming convention, and you know that all of your uh, Nova nodes have uh, FQDN that matches a certain pattern, and you can uh, encode that into one of these expert knowledge validators. Uh, you may know that all of your Nova nodes uh, live in a certain predefined IP block, and you can verify that the provided FQDN resolves to 
uh, an IP within that range, and you can do various sensible things about making sure that the appropriate roles are, are present and what have you for provisioning uh, Nova resources. So you could write very specific um, rule sets for, ver for individual bits within the cloud deployment and use a, a siloed version of Anchor to enforce those. So assuming that the decision engine said everything is great, uh, this is a valid and reasonable uh, and correct CSR, then the next step is actually issuing the certificate. Uh, so this actually is probably the most straightforward bit of the whole thing. It's, it's very basic. Um, we don't really write our own crypto code here for obvious reasons. Uh, we're using um, PyCA cryptography, which is a, an excellent, very high quality uh, library, which wraps through an FFI interface, OpenSSL, various other backends. So we actually needed to add a little bit of X509 code of our own just to wrap uh, the FFI bindings exposed by uh, cryptography. Some functionality was missing, though hopefully that's changed since I wrote this. Um, and uh, yeah, we emit uh, appropriate audit logs to say, yes, we issued this certificate for this person on this date, and so on and so forth. So. Okay, uh, so that's basically a sort of whistle-stop tour of Anchor. Um, it's a very early project, as I said, so we've got a fairly extensive roadmap of bits and pieces that we're going to be working on going forward, but here are a few of the highlights. So our documentation isn't exactly where we'd like it to be today, so we're going to, um, pretty much straight after this, actually, we're going to be uh, putting a bunch of effort into making that uh, come up to scratch. We obviously want to replace this bit of X509 wrapping code that we have and, and call directly into uh, PyCA cryptography. Uh, so a Barbican plugin would be a really great thing to have. Barbican, as of Kilo, I believe, has um, uh, certificate operations now. Uh, so it'd be great to be able to use Anchor as the backend CA for those operations. Uh, we'd like to add a KMIT-based uh, HSM interface layer so that we can use a uh, hardware security module for uh, the certificate operations rather than the locally available um, OpenSSL library or whatever. Uh, we'd also like to put in uh, the PyCADF library for uh, nicer audit logs and uh, various bits and pieces that you get from that. Uh, more validators will emerge as we explore additional use cases uh, we've talked about a message queue model for getting the certificates, uh, so you can use a queue to issue requests and, and get your certificates. Uh, and some app armor uh, profiles would be great for uh, hardening the whole thing. So those are all things that we're working on. Uh, so if this has uh, piqued anybody's interest, uh, then you know, we'd always welcome patches, uh, comments, inputs, whatever. Uh, would be great. So. That's all I have. I'm going to now pass the floor to Tom, who will talk about how we actually use this thing. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hello, I'm Tom Cowan. I'm on the uh, compute team for HP's Helion OpenStack. But recently, I've been looking at using TLS uh, in our deployment and getting TLS everywhere using Anchor. So we've been running Anchor in, uh, in, in production now for about a few months since our 1.0 release. So I'm going to run through how we've done this and uh, lessons we've learned. So this is all based on triple uh, O deployment 1.0. Uh, so there's already work done by the community to get some TLS in uh, in triple O. So we based our initial uh, initial design around uh, what was already there. So this is the existing architecture where you get client connection coming in to the control plane. So the control plane is uh, just like management node running all the API servers, all the interesting stuff like that. So connection comes in to the virtual IP address, the VIP, which is assigned to one of the nodes in that, in that cluster. And this is hands off uh, to, the, to the load balancer and then off to the local service running on the IP address. So we used that, and we added a bit into the gap. So now we've got the client using its native HTTPS, coming into the load balance again, but this time handing off into the TLS terminator. We, in this case, we're using S-Tunnel. Uh, the reason we use this, rather than having uh, the services doing their own native uh, termination, is because they're not really designed for uh, reloading the certs every 12 hours. So we, we tried to implement it uh, natively, but the, none of the libraries are really there to reload certs on the fly. Uh, the Python libraries are, don't support that yet. Some, some services do, but we kind of went for this blanket approach using this TLS terminator. 
So this is a more like a physical diagram of how the connections flow through our cloud at the moment. How is that HA proxy load balances across the tunnel, and then the tunnel strips off the TLS and puts plain text across to, to the local host. So there's no unencrypted uh, communication across our cloud at all. So talk about a few of those components. So we've got S-Tunnel. Uh, S-Tunnel is configured to listen on a port, and then it needs another port to hand off to the unencrypted connection. So it's really easy to configure, works really well, and obviously you can reload certs on the fly. You just have to send a SIG up to it. Uh, the nice little gotcha we found was uh, there was a really bad bug in up to 5.9 where occasionally it would just prematurely close a connection. So we're having a glance, image downloads just fail completely randomly. Pretty easy to harden as well. Make sure you disable the SSL v2 and v3 unless you want to get poodled, uh, and make sure you choose your cipher suites. We've got a load balance HA proxy. It's, uh, the first thing to note is it doesn't really know about TLS at all. It's, it's running at layer four, so it just hands off TCP packets uh, to the services below. The thing we did have to change about it was the health checks. So the, the health checks pretty much just to make sure that the services underneath are alive and they're still running. Um, initially, they were, well, they, before they were using the default HA proxy checks, which were just socket connections to see the service still running. But now we've got this layer of S tunnel in between it. We have to do kind of full HTTP checks now, which has improved the availability of our cloud, actually. So we've configured that to be much nicer. We've actually made some better checks as well for uh, RabbitMQ and MySQL to check the partition and stuff as well. So deploying Anchor itself, really simple. It's based on PCAN, which means you can just make a virtual env, uh, pip install your requirements, uh, Make sure you app against install your other requirements, and then run it up on new whiskey or whatever whiskey-based uh, stack you want to use. Uh, we did that in triple O with an image element, uh, and then you can, we configure that with heat. So heat just adds all the information you need about uh, the validation rules, how long you want your certs valid for, and that'll go in and configure it. It works really nicely. Along with deploying anchor, you need some other things. You need NTP. Because we're issuing certs, every 12 hours, there's a small gap when you replace a cert, whereas if the nodes are out of sync, you can get uh, your node completely unavailable because, because the client uh, doesn't, doesn't trust it. So if the, if the, when the client connects to the server and the server has a, a cert which is issued in what the client thinks is the future, then it'll be like, oh, I can't do this. That's, it's an invalid certificate. So make sure you've got the timing on all your nodes really close. So we did have the option of, um, Backdating the issue date of the certificate, but we didn't want to do that hack, so we just made really NTP really tight on our cloud. Another problem with deploying uh, Anchor was you have to have everything behind TLS, so that means Anchor as well. So if you have, want to have, if you want to get your certs for your other nodes, initially you have to have your control plane nodes come up first. So we got this sort of ordering. So the control plane node has to get its cert first from the local host, uh, kick the tunnel into action again, so it can be, be accessed from the rest of the cloud. And then you're up from there. And obviously, before Anchor gets up, none of the other services can talk to each other because no one has a cert yet. So there's been some quite important ordering there. So the Anchor client is the client that has to retrieve the cert from Anchor, pass in all the information, create the CSR. Uh, also has to check the expiry. So when it, we want a new cert every 12 hours, we want to check when it's about to expire, when we need a new one, and then uh, generate CSR and talk to Anchor. We also uh, always get a new cert on reboot, which is uh, like a check we added because we we're finding out that when a node was coming back from a reboot, sometimes it was it wasn't out it wasn't in sync with NTP because NTP sometimes takes a while to catch up with what the real time is. We always get a new cert when we reboot, make sure it's the right it's valid for another 12 hours, and continue. Also, we got some other actions we need to do when we get a new certificate, such as kicks down onto life again, reload the certificate for the TLS terminator. So initially we looked at using CertMonger for this, but it was a bit too bulky. It was uh, quite a com complex configuration for it. Uh, it just wasn't simple enough for what we wanted. So we just went off and used some Cron and Bash. Uh, we've got recurring checks every couple of hours uh, with Cron. Uh, that just calls out to an OpenSSL command you can see over there, which just repiles the date, check it's the right, if it's it's about to expire in the next hour, we'll get a new certificate. 
generate a new CSR, well, I have to generate a new CSR, talk to Anchor using that curl command, and Anchor will talk back to us, hopefully give us a certificate, and we can carry on. So some of the problems we faced uh, deploying this, uh, one of the big ones was clustering traffic. Clustering traffic is really hard to deal with ephemeral PKI. Uh, both Rabbit and MySQL have clustering traffic uh, with, with TLS, but it's, it's not really possible to do that natively with ephemeral certificates, mainly because they neither of them support reloading certificates while having a cluster up. So MySQL Galera clustering actually uh, requires all the nodes in the cluster to have the same private key and certificate. So it doesn't make sense at all to choose uh, private keys, uh, ephemeral private keys there and uh, refresh it. So you'd have to reboot the cluster as well. It's just got really messy. Uh, similar sort of thing for Rabbit. Uh, we did talk to the Rabbit team. I think they're making progress on being able to refresh certificates as you go along. But as of the moment, it's not there yet. So we do use long-lived certificates for these, but we can't use ephemeral PKI, unfortunately, yet. Uh, so configuring open stack services was a bit pain also. There's so many different like, flags and protocol settings you have to do in all these different config files. So it took our team like, a couple of weeks to really find all the little config values we had to get and set them all. And then eventually we got TLS everywhere, which was great. But it took a while to find them all. And we had to patch a few uh, client repos as well. So I think there is some work being done upstream to unify all these options. So it's coming. But we had to find it all. <laughs> uh, the monitoring as well was a bit tricky. That's because. Uh, when we get the certificates for, for the nodes, they're actually the certificates assigned for virtual IP address on the control plane. Uh, that means the monitoring wants to go in directly to the node. It can't, you, it can't validate the certificate for the actual node itself. It has to validate for uh, the IP address, or the, the virtual IP address. So we have to turn off cert validation for monitoring, which isn't a big deal, but it's a nice to have. So some improvements we're looking at doing in uh, Helion 2.0, Helion Upstack 2.0. We want to have a more layered termination. So where we saw HA proxy not, not aware of TLS, we want to have it aware of TLS and then re-encrypt, pass on. And that, that gives us a lot more flexibility of how we, uh, we control that. Uh, also want to have uh, multiple, multiple IPs uh, supported in the subject alt name. So that means you can have the cert valid for multiple IP addresses or addresses. Also looking at doing more silo deployments, so per service. Uh, per service uh, certificates, which would really harden us a lot. Uh, and also having a look at having had the services uh, listen on a Unix socket. So rather than having uh, your service running on the network, you can keep it, keep, keep it completely local and have S-Tunnel hand off to the Unix socket, which would be really great. So here's a few references for you. Uh, our cat head is a project I've been working on locally, which kind of solves the, rather than using Chrono Bash for Search tracking and search, uh, retrieval. It's a bit of Python code, which does some bit smarter uh, scheduling and talks directly to Anchor, extendable. So check that out if you're interested in that sort of stuff. Uh, obviously, you've got Anchor in Stackforge, um, the security project, and everything else. Thanks, guys. Uh, if you've got any questions, I think we've got some time. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so a quick question about the, uh, the cron with the curl. Um, is there any, the cron uh, job yep. with the curl. Um, is there any plans to use a, a configuration file or allow us to use a configuration file instead of the username and password so it doesn't make it into the process list? Uh, for the anchor client sort of stuff? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think um, that project I was talking about at the end there, at Cathead, is a lot more configurable, a lot more open, and we've got some plans to really put some time into that to make it that, so it's definitely possible to do that, put the configuration values in that rather than the cron job. So yes, it's definitely a good point. OK, thanks. A uh, couple of questions at the conceptual level. Um, you're using username and password to authenticate initially. So if someone hacks the username and password and therefore gets the certificate, uh, what do you do for the next 24, 48 hours? That's the first question. The second one is someone or an entity genuine that's got a certificate and it's about to expire in, say, five minutes, uh, and then it it's actually wants to authenticate to do something that's going to, say, last 10 minutes or longer than the life of the certificate. Okay, so uh, please stay near the mic just in case oh. I need, you need to. Um, 
So the, the first question was regarding the uh, username and password used to request a certificate and what happened if someone compromised that username and password. Um, so, the pers so first of all, um, you should be deploying this in production using Keystone uh, or LDAP rather than the uh, static username and password, um, which gives you some level of protection there. Um, but the idea is that you should tie your validators down quite tightly. And the validators are completely user controllable, so you, you, you tailor them to your system. And they should be built so that only a person who, sorry, only a node that meets those criteria can request a certificate. And it'll only be able to request a certificate that meets the criteria of the validator. So um, you could only issue a certificate to Nova rather than Google.com, say. Um, there obviously is the issue that if you log into the uh, CA um, and you could compromise the certificate, um, that's the same as every other CA out there. Um, so this doesn't particularly change that risk profile. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your second question. I think I can answer that one. So you're saying okay. uh, if the certificate uh, expires during the connection, is that what it? Yeah. So yeah, I don't yeah. think that's really a problem because uh, the, only, the only time it validates is when it uh, initiates a connection or during a renegotiation of the connection. And typically, services don't ever issue renegotiations, or often you delay, disable the renegotiation. So uh, yeah, I don't think that's really an issue. It, even if you, you expire while the connection is going, it should just be fine. And okay. uh, to add to that, um, we should have mentioned that we have it configured, and we generally recommend it to be configured, that if your certificate expires in, say, four hours' time, you request a new certificate. Um, and then roll that in in place early so yeah. that you're not running right up to the certificate window and yeah. then replacing it. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, you said replace with LDAP, but I mean LDAP still username password, isn't it? Yes. So. Um, so this is where the validators come in. So it should only grant the node that is requesting a certificate, um, a certificate for that node. Um, or similar nodes in the area. You shouldn't be able to request a much broader certificate. Right, but I mean, do, does it actually check that the request is coming from the node, or is it just purely the username and password that is sufficient to prove that it's from oh, that node? So it yeah. will do things like a reverse lookup on the IP that the uh, certificate is being issued for, and check that against the IP address the request was submitted for, from. Yeah. So if you've submitted a request from 1.1.1 and you're requesting a certificate for Google.com, it will notice that your 1.1.1 isn't the address for Google.com and then log it, raise it to your ARC site, and um, administrator should investigate. Right. Okay, so, so you've got some checks in, but, but ultimately the, the issue is if you find out after a certificate's been issued, for whatever reason that it was issued wrongly, you, you are effectively screwed for that amount of time till the 24 or 48 hours runs out, yeah? Correct. Yeah. But that's no different to using CRLs where you're screwed for well, as long as yeah. it takes them to propagate. That, that, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, sort of following off uh, one of his questions, um, is there interest in adding uh, support for different authentication such as GSS API or getting a remote user header from Apache? And Okay, and uh, the other question is, um, can you add extra fields to the certificates that you sign? So, to answer your first question, uh, the authentication stuff is uh, pluggable modules. So, uh, if you want to add additional authentication schemes for various scenarios, then the, the system can be extended to, to incorporate those. Okay. Um, and your, your second question was, uh, could you repeat it? So adding, adding extra fields onto the certificates oh, that okay. get issued. Yeah, so the, the actual validation of the CSR is dependent upon how you've configured your rule chains. So if you create um, validators that look for and accept uh, custom fields, and there are no other validators which will reject those fields, then that should work fine. Um, so because it, it we provide a number of building blocks, effectively, and you can mm. assemble those in however you see best for your particular policy. Okay, thank you. I, I should say as well, sorry, that the uh, you can add validators quite easily as well. So if you want to add custom validators, the idea is that we will acquire a library of validators um, as more usage scenarios emerge, uh, and we just extend it. 
Uh, hi. You mentioned at one point you had a uh, issue with image downloads intermittently failing. What was the cause of that? Did you say? Uh, that was to do with a bug in Stunnel up into S Tunnel into up to 5.9. So there was it was just prematurely closing the TCP connection before before it was actually needed to be closed. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Is everyone then? Great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.